Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, this is one of the first of the series of uh, online lectures uh, and online sessions. So today's session is about introduction to occlusion and characteristics of an ideal occlusion. And the learning objectives of uh, this online session uh, are that uh, the, by the end of this session, our lecture, students will be able to describe the concepts of occlusion. Uh, what is normal occlusion? What is ideal occlusion? What is static and what is dynamic occlusion? And uh, as we have already discussed earlier, uh, the structure of the temporomandibular joint and its relation uh, to function. And temporomandibular joint uh, is a very complex structure. Uh, and its function is not totally known. So we'll be looking at what is known and what is unknown. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, by the end of this session, students will be able to relate the functional significance of the curve of Spee and the curve of Wilson and the differences as well. And um, in terms of occlusion, uh, by the end of the session, students will be able to know the difference between centric relation and centric occlusion. And, um, they would be able to uh, enumerate and, uh, and enlist the characteristics of an ideal occlusion. So uh, the basic structure of the temporomandibular joint. The temporomandibular joint, as we know, we have two temporomandibular joints. And if one temporomandibular joint moves, the other moves as well. So there is simultaneous movements in uh, both the temporomandibular joints. Whenever we speak, whenever we pronounce anything, whenever we are eating or chewing, so both our temporomandibular joints are simultaneously moving. So uh, this is the temporal bone that we are talking about. And this temporal bone articulates with the temporomandibular, uh, with the condylar process of the mandible. And this is the condylar process of the mandible. So uh, that is why it is known as the temporomandibular joint since it involves the temporal bone of the skull along with the condylar process or the condylar head of the mandible. Now temporomandibular joint is not just uh, a combination of bones but there is an underlying uh, articular disc in between that we are not able to see in this skull and uh, uh, this articular disc is a soft tissue and the movement of uh, the condyles in the temporal uh, mandibular joint takes place by the movement of the articular disc. Now there are other anatomical landmarks of temporal mandibular joint and one of these the anterior most uh, landmark is known as the articular eminence. So this is the articular eminence and then there is the fossa in which the condyles actually fits in uh, or articulates and this is known as the glenoid fossa and is also known as the mandibular fossa. So um, uh, the anterior most portion is the articular eminence and then we have the uh, glenoid or the mandibular fossa. Uh, now the steepness or the flatness of the articular eminence here the steepness and the flatness of the articular eminence actually uh, uh, not only limits the anterior movements of the temporal of the condylar process, but it also dictates and guides anteriorly the movement of the condyle in the condylar fossa or in the mandibular fossa. Okay, now uh, we'll just briefly uh, retreat on the structures of the temporal mandibular joint and how it actually relates to the function. So uh, as you can see in this picture, we have the condylar process here and then we have the temporal bone and this is the articular eminence here. Uh, the articular uh, eminence as we have already discussed, it, it has a posterior slope here and the steepness and the flatness actually guides the uh, the movement of the condyle within this mandibular fossa and this is known as the posterior guidance. So posterior guidance is, is, is the guidance provided by the articular eminence to the condyle so that it can move inside the glenoid fossa. Now intervening in between the glenoid fossa 
and the condyle, we can see a soft tissue and this soft tissue is known as the articular disc. Uh, there's another name for it and it's known as the temporomandibular disc. Now this disc is of fibrous cartilage or it is known of, it's, uh, it's totally fibrous. In origin, there is no cartilage in it as well. And, uh, uh, and this articular disc divides this glenoid or the mandible fossa into two cavities. There's, we have an upper joint cavity and then we have the lower joint cavity. The lower joint cavity is involved in opening and closing movements. Uh, and these correspond to the hinge type movements while the upper joint cavity is involved in translatory or translation uh, which means that the condyle not only rotates around its axis but actually goes down in the glenoid fossa and this movement usually takes, takes place when there are lateral mandibular movements specifically or exclusively when we move our jaws from uh, 15 to 20 millimeters open wide when we open our uh, jaws more than two millimeters then um, uh, the condyle actually not only rotates around its hinge axis but actually goes down the linear fossa and this movement or this translatory movement takes place in the upper joint space and both of these upper joint space and lower joint space are uh, lubricated by the synovial fluid Uh, now that we have already discussed the structure of the temporomandibular joint, uh, there are certain uh, ligaments that are not only supporting the temporomandibular joint, but they are also supporting the mandibular uh, function that is mastication and chewing and opening and closing. And the primary or the principal ligament of the temporomandibular joint is also known as the same uh, 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 same it has the same name as the temporomandibular joint it is known as the temporomandibular ligament and it can be viewed at, on the lateral side of the mandible and since it is on the lateral side or, or the outer side of the mandible it is known as the temporomandibular ligament or the lateral ligament also known as the lateral ligament and one of the primary uh, functions of the lateral ligament or the temporomandibular ligament is to limit the movement and by limiting the movement is actually protecting the muscles and it is protecting the teeth as well and all of these ligaments that we are talking about whether they are primary ligaments or they are accessory ligaments or supplementary ligaments all of them are actually non-elastic okay so uh, on the medial side we have two accessory ligaments uh, this is the stylomandibular ligament and this is the sphenomandibular ligament. Okay, so uh, just briefly we will talk about the articular disc and the retro discal tissues. This is the articular disc as it is shown here. It has uh, three portions or three parts of it. Uh, there is an anterior part, there is an intermediate part and then there is the posterior part. Okay, so the, th the thinnest part is the anterior part, middle part is uh, or the intermediate part is actually thicker than the anterior part, but the most thickest part is the posterior part. The posterior part of the articular disc is actually confluent with retrodiscal tissues. The articular disc uh, by itself it is avascular and aneural. By avascular, what we mean uh, is that there are no blood vessels within the articular disc and there are no neural elements. So it's avascular without any vascular elements, without any blood vessels and aneural meaning there are no neural elements, there are no nerves. So there, there are no blood vessels and there are no nerves in this articular disc. That is why the normal mandibular movements, be it uh, talking, pronunciation, enunciation, mastication, chewing, all of these are painless. Why? Because the articular disc has no pain fibers and it has no uh, and, and it has no neural elements it has no blood vessels uh, but the the posterior part of the articular disc is confluent with the retrodiscal tissues and these retrodiscal tissues uh, they have blood vessels and they're highly innervated so they, they have blood vessels and they are uh, and if the condylar disc if there's any dislocation if there's any pathology 
uh, if there's any trauma. Uh, so what happens is, and if this condyle, uh, if this condyle process of the mandible, it articulates instead of articulate disc, if it art articulates posteriorly uh, in the lateral discal tissues, or the lateral discal tissues are pushed uh, uh, in, instead of the articulate disc. So what happens is the loading or the mastication becomes painful. Here is the pi concave shape of the temporary material disc and it is attached to the neck of the condyle by these collateral ligaments. And um, as the articulate disc has no blood vessels and it has no neural elements, similarly the collateral ligaments have they have no innervation and they have no vascularization, it means there are no blood vessels and there are no nerves in it. Uh, the temp uh, and the collateral ligaments along with the uh, temporomandibular ligament are known as the primary or principal ligaments of the temporomandibular joint, while the accessory or supplementary ligaments, as we have discussed earlier, are the sphenomandibular ligament, the stylomandibular ligament, and then we have uh, otomandibular ligament, and then they are discomalleolar ligament and the retinacular ligaments. We'll be discussing those uh, in uh, when we discuss the structure of the temporomandibular joint. Uh, now we come back to how the teeth are actually aligned, and uh, when the teeth are aligned within the dental arches and when they contact uh, each other, uh, what happens is there's an imaginary line that we can see here, and this imaginary line is not straight. And this imaginary line which starts from the uh, tip of the canine and it goes posteriorly up to the second or the third molar is actually it is it, it, this line it actually curves and this curvature which is usually found in the anterior posterior direction or uh, this curvature is found in the sagittal direction and this curvature which is formed by the alignment of teeth is known as the curve of speed uh, speed uh, uh, was the an anatomist in the 16th century who discovered this and that is why it has been named after him. So curve of is basically a curvature which is found in the anterior posterior direction and it starts from the tip of the canine and it uh, to the last standing molar. And it is convex in the maxillary arch and it is concave in the mandibular arch. So what is the functional significance of uh, curve of speed? and curvophilism. We have not discussed curvophilism, but we'll be discussing it later on. Uh, Curvophilism, uh, due to this curvature, which is found in uh, the anterior posterior direction, it allows for, for the normal functional protrusion. By protrusion, we mean when we uh, move our mandible forwards. So, uh, and these forward movements are needed when we are chewing any uh, food particles or food debris or <laughs> food bolus. Uh, so whenever we are eating uh, this protrusion, it takes place and it is one of, considered to be one of the mandibular movements. Now the curve of Wilson uh, is usually found in the uh, mediolateral direction and it also allows for the lateral movements that are found during chewing. So we'll, uh, this is the curve of speed. And another name for it is known as the compensating curve and it is found only in the antero posterior direction or the sagittal plane. This is another picture of the curve of speed. And uh, what actually happens is if we uh, place any uh, horizontal object between the last molar and the anterior teeth and then uh, uh, if it coincides with it, then we see that some of the uh, teeth they are not contacting this horizontal object and these are not contacting because of the curve of speed and this is a definition from uh, Dawson's book uh, this, this is a, one of the most comprehensive definitions of uh, the curve of speed that I have ever found so uh, this curve of speed is aligned so that the continuation of the arc ex actually extends through the condyle and the curvature, since it is not a straight plane, it is curved, and this curvature uh, uh, is averaged to the part of a circle with a four-inch radius. This is what we are being shown in this curve of speed. If we extend it uh, posteriorly, it will, pa uh, it will pass through the condyles, 
and then it is actually a part of the uh, sphere, part of the circle with a 4 inch radius. Okay, uh, and this is the curve of Wilson. Curve of Wilson is, is a curvature of teeth, uh, specifically the lingual posteriority. The lingual posteriority, they are not, they are not straight. Okay, and they, they are not perpendicular to the horizontal plane or the occlusal plane. They are actually tilted lingually. And this 45 degrees lingual tilt of the posterior teeth forms a curvature. And this curvature, which is found in the metal lateral direction, is known as the curve of Wilson. So I will just repeat again. Curve of Wilson is formed by the lingual tilt or lingual inclination of the mandibular posterior teeth. These mandibular posterior teeth. They are tilted lingually and this curve they form a curvature which is known as the curve of Wilson and it is found in the medial lateral direction. Okay, and if we extend uh, the medial lateral curvature of or the curve, curve of Wilson, it will also form a circle or a sphere of, with a four-inch radius. And what is the impact of uh, what is the functional significance of the curve of Wilson? The curve of Wilson allows for easy access to the occlusal table. So the tongue is uh, lying just uh, so that it contacts the occlusal surface of the lingually tilted teeth and it stops uh, uh, the food to be impacted in between uh, the tongue and the teeth. Okay, so it actually the tongue actually helps to propel the food particles directly onto the occlusal surface because of this lingual inclination of. So the main function of the tongue is that it actually dumps uh, all of the food uh, once it has been chewed uh, into our palate and then it is actually then swallowed. So the main function of the tongue is to dump the food laterally on the teeth. Uh, so that it can be masticated and it can be chewed into smaller particles. And here is where the curve of Wilson, the significance of curve of uh, Wilson comes. Okay, now this is a diagrammatic representation of uh, the three curvatures. We have the curve of speed, which is uh, in the central direction. Then we have the curve of Wilson, which is in the medial lateral direction. And uh, thirdly, we have the reverse curve of Wilson. When the teeth are oppositely, they, instead of being in the middle lateral direction, they are also in the middle lateral direction, but they are on the opposite side. And uh, orthodontists, um, they usually uh, reverse the curve of SPI and the curve of Wilson so that uh, the movements of teeth, they can take place. Uh, one more thing, one important thing uh, to, to be considered here is that both these curvatures, be it the curve of SPI or the curve of Wilson, they are both physiological. And whatever, uh, um, teeth, whatever happens, uh, the curvatures are then not, not only the teeth come back to these curvatures uh, and we have to be cognizant of these curvatures whenever, whenever we are making crowns, whenever we are making restorations and whenever we are moving teeth as well in orthodontics. Uh, um, as uh, these uh, curvatures, they need to be respected as these curvatures are directly linked to mastication and chewing. Okay, now if we combine both of these uh, curvatures, the curve of Sui and the curve of Wilson, we have uh, a new curvature which is known as the plane of occlusion or the plane of occlusal curvature and it's also known as the monsoon's curve. This is monsoon's curve and not monsoon curve. Uh, which we are hoping to, which are, which are, which we are expecting by hopefully by next month. But this is not monsoon. This is monsoon. Monsoon is a uh, anatomist who actually discovered it into the in the 18th century, uh, and uh, this is known as the three-dimensional curve of monsoon. So it is a combination of the curve of uh, Wilson and the curve of Spi. So we have a curvature in the medial lateral direction, which is known as the curve of Wilson, and then we have in the Entero posterior direction of the central direction, this is the curve of speed. So if we combine both of them, then we have this plane of occlusion. Okay, so this is the definition of plane of occlusion. So if we combine it or uh, just a wax plate or a horizontal object if we place on the uh, on on the teeth, then 
so that it is contacting the buccal cuspids and then sagittal edges of the mandibular teeth then a, this plane is known as the plane of occlusion and posteriorly uh, this plane actually uh, includes the and if we extend it it goes past the condyles okay what we need to understand here is that this plane is not flat okay so we have already talked about the anterior posterior curvature and we have already talked about the medial lateral curvature because of these two curvatures this plane is not flat and when whenever we are restoring teeth we should not be the teeth should not be uh, horizontally placed in the occlusal arch and uh, uh, what happens if the teeth are horizontally uh, made are uh, the alignment is such that uh, they are contacting uh, horizontally are flat uh, this will actually uh, be more difficult for mastication and for chewing and a curved plane another good feature of this plane of uh, occlusion on monson's curve is that it actually maximizes all the tooth contacts and it uh, so that maximum intercaspation can take place and so that the four particles are maximally in contact with the occlusal surfaces of the teeth Okay. Uh, before we go on to the occlusion and the characteristics of an occlusion, uh, what we need to know is that whenever the mandible it closes with the maxilla, there is always an ideal way for the teeth to contact, and there is always an ideal place for the condyle and disc to be situated. Now, these two ideal places, the ideal way for the teeth to teeth to contact, and the ideal place of the condyles in the glenoid fossa or in the mandibular fossa, we'll be looking at both of these. Uh, terminologies will be looking at both of these features. Okay, so we will start off by uh, centric occlusion. Now, uh, uh, all of this lecture that uh, I'm delivering is actually corresponds to uh, the Berkowitz book and uh, the chapter number two, which is the dental osseous structures, and uh, we have already discussed about the anatomical occlusion of teeth. Uh, now we are talking about the maximum intercaspation. Maximum intercaspation is actually also known as centric occlusion, and in the Berkowitz, it's known as a centric occlusal position. And uh, what we need to know is it's a, a tooth-related position in which the teeth are maximally in contact with each other. Although it seems that uh, the, it is the most comfortable position, but it is one of the most difficult position to be reproduced. It is easily achievable. Uh, it is most comfortable, but it is not always reproducible. By not always re re reproducible, I mean sometimes the patient will contact the, the teeth in protrusion. Sometimes he will not be able to contact all of the teeth. So the dentist has to guide these teeth in uh, centric occlusion. He has to check that all of the teeth are maximally in contact with each other. There are different exercises uh, uh, which have been uh, practiced by prosthodontists like uh, uh, asking the patient to uh, contact his uh, tip of the tongue to, to the back of the palate, okay, tell him to swallow it, uh, and all of these uh, exercises are meant for teeth uh, to, to be present in centric occlusion or maximum intercaspation. Now we need to know the synonyms as well because different books have different terminologies for it. So centric occlusion is maximum intercaspation and it is also known as habitual occlusion, habitual centric and centric occlusal position. So these are just some of the names of the same. But what, what is actually happening in all of these is that teeth are maximally in contact with each other. So we have anterior teeth and the posterior teeth that are maximum. And, uh, why is considered to be an ideal occlusion? It is considered to be an ideal occlusion because there is adequate overlap of the teeth. The teeth are uh, uh, the, uh, the anterior teeth and the posterior teeth. They are both simultaneously contacting each other. They are both contacting at the same time, and the posterior teeth are uh, dominant in this contact. As you can see, uh, the posterior teeth uh, there is cusp to fossa region. So the cusp uh, uh, is actually uh, the cusp of the mandibular teeth is uh, occluding with the fossa of the maxillary, uh, maxillary posterior teeth. The posterior teeth are dominating while they are, and they are uh, contacting 
actively while the anterior teeth are passively in contact with each other and there are multiple contacts on all of the teeth so that the masticatory forces are the forces of chewing are dissipated equally throughout okay so uh, from central occlusion or uh, the tooth lateral position we are now going to describe the centric relations and what is centric is centric relation is a condylar related position uh, and it is irrespective of whether teeth are contact with each other whether teeth are not in contact with each other and where, whether they are teeth present or whether they are not teeth present it is a totally purely condylar related position so centric relation is relationship of the condyles within the condyle disc assembly and uh, usually it is considered a centric relation why because it's, it is a rest position of the condyles and in this rest position of the condyles the condylar process or the condylar head actually rests in the intermediate most portion of the articular disc this is the intermediate position it is the condyle is actually contacting there and it's also one of the thinnest portions of the disc and it describes the most stable position of the con condyle and, and where is this position it is anterior and superior most position another thing to understand is that central relation why does central relation happen uh, central relation happens because and why is it a superior anterior most position it is because of the direction or the pull of the muscles we can see two muscles here uh, this muscle is the temporalis muscle and this is the masseter muscle uh, which is one of the most powerful muscles of the muscles of mastication and as we can see uh, the directional pull of the temporalis muscle is anteriorly is 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 superiorly well while the direction pull of the masseter muscle here is more anterior so the reason why the condyle sits in its anterior and superior most position is because of the arrangement and pull of the muscles of mastication as well as the uh, direction and pull of the temporomandibular ligament okay so we are talking about ideal occlusion and in ideal occlusion centric relation and maximum intercuspation they occur simultaneously so what happens is in an ideal occlusion uh, what happens is when the teeth are maximally in contact with each other at the same time the condyle is in its anterior and superior most position or uh, it is in centric relation although it is considered to be ideal but we cannot say it is normal because more than 85% of the population has a discrepancy and this discrepancy is found uh, between the centric relation and the maximum intercuspation so what happens is when the teeth are in centric relation uh, sometimes one of the posterior teeth sometimes two posterior teeth are contact and then there is a slide from central relation to maximum intercuspation and this slide is known as long centric or it is also known as a discrepancy uh, but we are right now we are focusing only on the ideal occlusion so in maximum intercuspation uh, forces are concentrated on the long axis of the tooth and the posterior contacts So here again, uh, we are talking about the slide from uh, central relation to maximum intercuspation, and uh, the ideal occlusion that we have talked about is only found in 15% of the population. And uh, what we tell them is that uh, uh, this ideal occlusion, meaning that central relation and maximum intercuspation being uh, taking place simultaneously, but in most of the other individuals, uh, what happens is the centric teeth contact in centric relation one or two teeth and then there is a slide uh, the teeth actually slide into maximum intercuspation okay uh, we have uh, i had agreed to talk about uh, that there is an ideal way for the teeth to contact and there is ideal place for the condyle and disc to be situated and these two uh, are actually definitions of centric occlusion and centric relation so we'll uh, now enumerate and discuss the characteristics of an ideal occlusion in an ideal occlusion we already talked about that maximum intercuspation and centric relation takes place simultaneously or centric occlusion is equal to centric relation 
and now there are certain terminologies that are specific to the movements of the mandible uh, so protrusive movement means anterior movements of the mandible when you move our teeth uh, when we move our mandible forwards and retrusive when once we have moved our mandible forwards then uh, uh, the process of moving our mandible posteriorly uh, is known as retrusion or the retrusive movements and then we have eccentric movements by eccentric movements we mean uh, away from the center so we have eccentric movements uh, these are the lateral movements the right and left movements that are used in so uh, in an ideal occlusion the protrusion are uh, the forward movement of the mandibular teeth or the mandible is actually guided by the anterior teeth. The anterior teeth, when your teeth are uh, maxillary in contact with each other, that is the anterior occlusion. And if you want to move our teeth from maximum intercuspation to protrusion or to forward movement, then the teeth have to slide uh, on the anterior teeth. The posterior teeth will be disappluted. The posterior teeth will not be contacting each other while they will be uh, they, will, they will be guided into protrusion by the inclines of the uh, anterior upper teeth and this guidance of the anterior teeth which is being provided to the posterior teeth or the posterior disocclusion of teeth is known as uh, anterior guidance now anterior guidance is guidance by the anterior teeth to the posterior teeth so that they can move in protrusion now we have other movements which are known as the lateral movements are guided by the canine and ideally they should be guided by the canine and uh, these are known as and uh, canine guidance so little movements are uh, uh, the mental movements from right to left here we are being shown a left movement and during the left lateral movement the right side is considered to be the balancing side or the non-working side okay and the left side will will be working side so the lateral movements there are two different types of movements are two different types of guidance in the lateral movements the first is the canine guidance that we have talked about ideal ideally the teeth uh, only, only the canine uh, occludes while the teeth move from uh, from right to left and then another type of movement that is uh, usually used in uh, prosthodontics is the group function in which uh, there is gradual uh, contact of teeth from the anterior to the posterior and it is also considered to be the secondary so uh, briefly we'll just look at uh, crossover what is crossover crossover uh, by crossover i mean there is canine or cuspid crossover the canine actually crosses over uh, from uh, when the teeth are mo being moved laterally either right either left and uh, the teeth actually glide by the canine and they move from uh, the disocclude and they move uh, from right to left and uh, the purpose of this crossover is to smoothly transfer uh, the movement of the posterior teeth to the incisors so now we we'll just look at the we'll try to summarize the characteristics of an of an ideal occlusion so in ideal occlusion centric relation and uh, centric occlusion are centric occlusal position as discussed in the book uh, berkowitz uh, they occur simultaneously secondly all of the teeth are contacting that is why it is known as maximum intercuspation when the teeth are maximally in contact with each other all of the forces are directed longitudinally and this is an ideal way uh, for teeth to withstand all of the occlusal forces the posterior teeth are uh, contacting are dominating by the cusp fossa relationship and the anterior teeth are passively in contact with each other and the eccentric movements by eccentric movements we mean the lateral movements they are guided by the or uh, the protrusion uh, is actually guided by the uh, anterior teeth while uh, the lateral movements are guided by the canine or the group function and there should be no uh, crossover contacts on the on the anterior teeth. So, this is just uh, to take home message so that everyone remembers. So, condylar, when we're talking about condylar position, we're talking about centric relation and it's a condylar related position. When we're talking about 
tooth position, then this is centric occlusion or maximum tertius position or centric occlusal position. And when we are uh, talking about protrusive movements, then protrusive movements are actually guided by the anterior teeth. And lateral movements are guided by the, uh, uh, by the canine. And this is known as canine guidance. So anterior guidance is guidance provided by the anterior teeth to the posterior teeth so that they can move in protrusion, while the lateral movements or the eccentric movements are actually guided by the canine. Now, I would like to bring about uh, what is posterior guidance? Posterior guidance is actually provided by the uh, posterior slope of the articular eminence and it guides the condyle uh, to move within the glen. Now we come to, uh, come to the conclusion. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.